was fake on Facebook. <laughs> hey guys, this is Savage Joy with Real Progressives. Um, thank you so much for tuning in if you're coming back. Um, apologies, we had some, um, well, okay, let me rephrase. I had some technical issues um, about an hour ago. Um, so we, I tried to do Facebook Live, that was an epic fail. Um, and thankfully my guest is awesome enough that he said he would try again. Um, so this is Tyler Vega. Um, he is a congressional candidate in Washington state in uh, district six. Um, he's actually running in the progressive party, um, which is pretty awesome because I never knew there was such a thing. Um, I'm learning so much about different states. Um, so thank you so much for coming back, Tyler. I really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, um, happy to do it. Absolutely. Um, Tyler is really awesome. We, um, I kind of hit him up a few weeks ago and have just been kind of like bothering him off and on since. Um, so Washington's super interesting as far as their voting process because um, you guys are um, open primary, correct? Yeah, uh, it's it's a it's more complicated than that. Actually, it's a top two primary, uh, specifically without party affiliations. So it's 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 wacky. It's it's a very unusual system. Um, I don't actually have to ask the Progressive Party uh, to run as a Progressive. I can put whatever I want. I can put Mickey Mouse Party on my ballot if I want to, and that is. Um, you know, I did ask and uh, the progressive party here is old school and they, they appreciate that, but you don't have to, you, anybody can run as a green or a Republican or a Democrat just by saying you are one. And that leads to some really serious problems in this state. And we have a, a lot of dinos and a lot of rhinos as a direct result of that. Um, I don't approve. I would like to get it overturned as would most of most, everybody would like to see the top two primary overturned in this state, to be honest. Okay. So you're saying it's kind of like California in the sense that, um, it could be two Democrats or. Oh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. And they, and they can both and anybody, regardless of political ideology and what the party says, can put Democrat behind their name. So it could be, you know, a, you know, a, a complete far left Green Party person running as a Democrat and a complete far right uh, Republican who wants to get elected in a blue district running as a Democrat against each other in the pri uh, in the in the general election as a result of our primary system. It's it's very unusual. So it's kind of like what the Democrats already do, how like a lot of them are already Republicans anyway. So, but it's like, yeah, okay. So <laughs> that's really interesting. And you guys do mail-in ballot, right? It's all vote by mail. Yeah. There, uh, I don't think there is, there's no, there are no in-person polling places. And um, yeah, and we have about three weeks starting next Wednesday. They mail out next Wednesday and they're due the 7th of, of or the 8th of August actually. So that being said, since there are no machines or, or waiting lines or anything like that, how do you have any kind of uh, reservations that your ballots will be received and counted? Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, there's no, there is no guarantee in our world that our elections are being handled fairly. I, I don't have any direct evidence, there's a fair amount of evidence mounting that they are not. And there are a number of people who say that vote by mail is just a horrible idea because it's too easy to tamper with. Um, I myself am a, a big fan of open source blockchain, uh, use the technology we've got, and I think we can solve it, but we would have to get into a position where people who cared enough about integrity and, and the system of checks and balances succeeding to implement that. I think that the people in, in power don't have any good reason to implement that. Um, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't spend a lot of time uh, rattling off about it, but we do need to solve that. And one of the ways we're going to solve that is by getting people into office who have a vested interest in the system functioning well for the people. Absolutely. Now, who who are the people you're running against? What what makes you different? Uh, pretty wide spectrum. It's a it's a three person race in a top two primary. Uh, the incumbent is a kind of classic neoliberal Democrat. He's been in there. He was basically uh, handed the, the district on a silver platter. Uh, he was a super delegate for Hillary and helped rig the 2016 primary and basically a, a corporate guy. You know, he's he, not a bad guy, but he is beholden to 
powers that be and the system that we're, in my estimation, are, are transitioning out of. So e even though he is uh, self-identifies and is called by some a progressive, um, I would certainly disagree with that, as would most progressives. He, uh, you know, I'm very much a centrist and, and basically votes, uh, you know, re Republican, right, conservative on money issues and votes left on the easy issues, you know, uh, abortion, um, you know, freedom of speech, you know, gun control. Um, I mean, I would, I would vote differently than he would on that as well. But, um, you know, the, the, the difference is, is really vast. I'm, I'm really, um, I'm a facet of a movement. I'm a tiny little facet of a, of a changing consciousness in the country that represents generations X, Y, Z and the millenn millennials really. And also, you know, the, the, the baby boomers as, as we saw them, in you know in the hippie movement in the in the in the anti-vietnam movement all those things all the all these uh i mean the list goes on the you know the dr king's movement the, the, the even the black panthers if you if you want to take the spectrum quite wide the people on some level know that the system of checks and balances has been failing us and somehow we know that we're the missing link I, and i know that for sure that that, that that the system of checks and balances requires civic participation by the citizens and, and, and robust participation by the citizens, or it will fail. It has failed. And so the, the, the movement that, that you and I are a part of is really the difference. It's not about how different I am, although that is also true. It's about how different we are than Derek Kilmer. And the other guy, you know, there's a third guy in the race uh, who I've never seen outside of his presence. You know, he's, he's kind of the token Republican who is kind of guaranteed to lose, but guaranteed to get 30%. Um, which incidentally is, uh, is kind of the the silver bullet because if I can outpace Derek in a top two primary and he's below this other guy, then basically I win in August. And and that is the great weakness of 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 the neoliberal establishment. It's like the uh, this quote keeps on coming to my mind. Uh, General Dodonna in uh, in the first Star Wars that ever came out uh, the year I was born. He says. Uh, the empire doesn't consider a small one-man fighter to be any threat. Otherwise, they'd have a tighter defense. Derek Kilmer hasn't put up a single sign, a single sign. He's not put up a single sign, yet he stands the chance of losing within less than a month. That's true all across the state of Washington. You've got incredible candidates like Sarah Smith challenging Adam Smith. You've got Tambourine Borelli challenging Denny Heck. You've got Dorothy Gasquet challenging uh, you know, the, the Republican incumbent. And these people are not don't take it seriously to the point that we actually could blow a couple of them out of the water in a matter of a couple of weeks, which is um, pretty interesting. And, and that's the kind of game we have to play because the system is stacked against us, but it does have some very uh, obvious obvious weaknesses. Yeah, absolutely. And and I talked about that on a show um, another time. It's they feel that they are so entitled and that they've already won that they don't have to do anything. And I think, yeah. you know, if you look at Alexandria, see, like, look, I haven't seen people fight that hard for a candidate since Bernie. Like, right. I mean, the amount of volunteers and everything like that, it's all about platform, getting your name out, everything like that. I love what I do. It's so rewarding. Um, looking into you, one of the, one of the things I do before I reach out and ask a candidate, um, if they want to come on, first of all, I see if they've promoted Hillary, if they have, sorry, ain't gonna happen. Um, uh, but I also look at if they were an activist, is this after Trump was elected, now I'm going to get off my ass or did you do something prior? And with you, I saw that you were an activist. You weren't, you know, suddenly like joining and all of a sudden becoming this person. So what were the things that got you started in activism? I know you're passionate about a lot of different causes. Wow. Um, um, where to start? Where to start? You know, well, I mean, it was really the war in Iraq uh, that got me really started. Uh, at the time, I was um, I was volunteering full time in a homeless shelter, and um, I got my jaw broken. I was breaking up, breaking up a fight, and um, and the guy who was on the ground getting kicked pops up. The cops show up, and everybody runs, and it's just me and this guy. And he takes a swing at me, and I um, take this punch that breaks my jaw in three in three places. So I 
had to kind of make a shift and I didn't feel comfortable continuing to work there. And I wind up on this peace walk, a peace walk that was going all the way down the West Coast, then up the middle of the country, and then up the East Coast to New York City to Ground Zero. And this is about a year after 9-11. And I met some incredible people, including a couple of uh, Native elders and some uh, a, a Buddhist nun and monk that were leading this walk and some people from all these different faiths that were coming together because they wanted to make a difference. And they had this way of doing so, which was to, to walk and to um, bridge gaps across known divides. And I learned more and more about just how kind of messed up things are. And eventually uh, came to the conclusion that, 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 that a person is, in, is uh, required to make a difference or else kind of like, we don't, we don't have a choice. We gotta, we gotta do this. And um, that was actually, Actually, that was just after, that was a one, okay, yeah, and then I would run for office. It would be shortly after coming back from that peace walk that I would run for office the first time. I think it was the year that Nader run, uh, ran, it might have been 04, I can't remember for sure. And then after that, uh, you know, that was, that was, that would be three or four years of, of doing the peace walk thing because I believed in the power of um, consciousness and I believed in the, in the power of people coming together across divides. For example, walking with a Jew and a Muslim uh, in the name of ending a war that was that appeared on the surface to be about their religions, which it's not. It's about money. It's about oil. It's about power. Uh, but it the but getting past it using that, those those gaps was really powerful. Anyway, so I tried politics back then, but gave up because we didn't have a movement. It, it was like a, a voice in the wilderness. There was just no way. And I I basically left politics, waiting for a day like today when we would have the masses rising up and trying to take our place. Um, after that, it was all about direct action. I didn't feel like the peace walk movement was going to do it. I didn't feel like it was enough, even though I still believed in the principles of consciousness and, and mindful change. Uh, and at that point, I really wanted to get into, um, into, into making a, a direct difference at, in the place that I was. And so I became a, a tree sitter, a forest defender. Um, a couple of decades, actually, after Julia Butterfly Hill would sit in Luna the end of that same story, uh, I would enter it at this kind of unusual part of the tale, and we would actually, uh, for all practical purposes, would have a great victory and, and would, be a, would see the actual trees that we were protecting would be, would, did get saved, and the, uh, the people came back together to, to reclaim these vast tracts of forest land to be run by a sustainable and mindful um, uh, company that was going to do it kind of right like they did in the olden days. Once upon a time, that forest was managed really intelligently um, as best as we could at the time. And now that that continues. And even though we suffered incredible losses, at the end of the day, that those vast tracts of wilderness, the, the lungs of North America, so to speak, um, are, are, are being handled in a very mindful and appropriate way. Uh, so I, I could go on and on, but I, I, I don't want to take the whole the whole time talking about uh, such things in the past when we have a, a peaceful revolution going on as we speak. But if, you know, to answer your question, I have been an activist my entire life and um, won't stop. Absolutely. I can sense that. I love your energy. Um, you, um, what made you, I know you said you run in the past, but what made you decide to run now, this time? What was the the final deciding factor. You mean 2018 or 2016? 18. 18. 2018, it was, um, it was actually a lawsuit. Uh, lawsuit uh, regarding the original First Amendment before the, before the Bill of Rights, the 10 amendments that we know about before, before those 10 amendments, there was an original First Amendment before that. It had to do with representation. We were, um, we were a brand new country. We were trying to figure out who we were, if we wanted to be a country, and we had just fought the War of Independence uh, and fought off the British over this issue of representation. And so there was a really complex conversation about representation going on. And those who are interested in this conversation, please Google the congressional uh, appro appropriation, apportionment, the congressional apportionment amendment, AKA article first, the original first amendment of the constitution. The 10 we got, the bill of rights were all of the ones that were basically consensus. They were easy, they were no brainers. Everybody was like, yep, for sure, let's go, kick them out. The, uh, the issue of representation was very, very complex because we had uh, this glaring problem of slavery, for example, to deal with. We didn't know how to deal with representation when we had people who we, who we and I say we meaning the, the white forefathers, didn't consider even to be humans. And so there's this famous uh, 
uh, agreement where that where where slaves become three fifths of a human, so that they, these people get this certain amount of representation, and but they still can't vote, and neither can women, and it's all only wealthy white landowners. Anyway, so that was literally like a 200, 300 year long conversation that we're still dealing with. You know, we still we're still dealing with that, and we haven't haven't dealt with the original First Amendment and the issue of representation. But at the end of the day, the way history went is that that amendment was actually ratified, uh, not not once, but more than once in history. And it said that we would get at least one representative for every 50,000 people. And so when I realized that, A, I didn't, I didn't know that there was an original First Amendment. And when I realized that that was the case and that there was a lawsuit bringing that back to the forefront and that if we were to enact that First Amendment, which has been ratified, it would... Uh, increase the size of the House of Representatives by uh, about a factor of eight, I realized, oh, the people could just take back the House of Representatives and reinsert their voice in Congress. And so I went uh, relatively crazy talking about the real First Amendment and uh, art AKA Article the First, AKA the Congressional Apportionment Amendment, uh, because I felt like that was the silver bullet. And I still do, to be honest, uh, but it's hard for people to take that seriously because it's so far out and people are just like, what, come on, you're serious that there's a first, like people actually don't believe that there's an amendment before the first amendment. And it's going to take a minute to, to really, uh, to, to really get people to understand that that's, that that's, it was the conversation that this country was based on. And that furthermore, the house of representatives is the voice of the people in the, in the government, which is lacking. And that's why the system of checks and balances doesn't work because it's missing one of its major pillars, the voice of the people. Anyway, so that's what got me to run in this particular case. In 2016, it was Bernie. I, you know, we challenged the superdelegates. I started the group called the Washington Bernie Kratz Coalition, and we got together one person to challenge every elected superdelegate in the state. And uh, that's a continuing mission that uh, will continue. I mean, you saw that uh, the superdelegates uh, conversation is alive and well right now as uh, on, on my Facebook page, uh, Adam Pike and, uh, and David McDonald are, are are hashing it out, and and that's a real thing, and uh, which probably doubles us back to the conversation about dem enter versus dem exit. Uh, to be clear, I'm both, and um, you know, with I'm 51% dem exit and or third party, 51% third party and 49% dem enter, if if such is possible. I, I definitely respect the inside and the outside path, but really want to see a, a parliamentary style thing, like we've got in Vermont. You know, Vermont just came out they just came out and said they're ready to work with work nationally you know they've been this incredible force the only place in the country where we have a three-party system in vermont the progressive party is uh, as linda knighton says it's uh it's too too big to be ignored and so they actually have a presence there they have a model for which we can run the future of this country and so i'm very much in support of that and that doesn't mean that we can't also uh bring the democratic party back into integrity in the meantime Progressive Party is it's the name that says what we are, and it's time to build that up. Uh, and now that Vermont is ready to do that, that's a huge thing. Like to the degree of you know, in in folklore, it's it's like Rohan coming to the aid of Minas Tirith, like that level of of huge in my world that that we can you know we we are ready to start building that. Whether it's it doesn't have to be a party; it can be an independent coalition, and they are aware of that, and we are aware of that, and everybody's working towards that same goal. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, very proud that I'm the um, first, if not only, um, independent journalist who's ever done Dem Enter, Dem Exit debates. Um, so I did two so far. I'm having a third one coming up. Very fascinating. It's, I mean, I, you know, I'm a very proud independent. When they fucked over Bernie, I was like, bye. Uh, but doesn't mean I won't, I, I do the uh, Dem for a day if I have to vote. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, there's so many different spectrums. You are correct. And, you know, the thing that is just incredible is um, closed primaries. I'm in Pennsylvania, and so ours are closed. You are so fortunate to have an open primary because, I mean, it, we'd have Bernie for president if we had him all over. I mean, um, yeah. so it also, you know, I digress, but I wanted to, um, I don't want to forget um, Laura. Um, she's in the comments, Laura Fielding. Um, she brought up um, the 1600 bill 
Um, and I do not want to forget to talk about that because if some as someone in Pennsylvania, I want to learn more about why that um, is specific to your state and what it's contingent on. Um, so if you could address that. Yeah, well, um, I mean, I 1600 was the was the great flagship of, of our movement in this state. And um, I mean, my only well, okay, I have a couple of minor reservations about running for office. My, you know, one of the few reservations I have is that I couldn't dive in fully and do that full time, you know, or what was left after full time, everything else. Uh, but I-1600 is, is, means in, uh, the I is for initiative and it's a six, you know, 1600 is the number and they, and they, they were the, uh, the first to register. And, and in Washington state, you can, the people can write legislation. And if you get enough signatures, which in this case, uh, or in all cases, is 250,000 valid signatures, then that initiative goes to the ballot. And then the people vote on it. And if it goes through, it is law. Uh, for example, the top two primary was an initiative written by the people, in theory, although uh, many say it was a, you know, we had, we had, we had the wool co pulled over our eyes. And this happens with initiatives, unfortunately. But it is, it's, a, it's the power of the people to write legislation. And you can do that in some states. Washington is one of them. I don't know if Pennsylvania is one of them. But the whole idea behind whole Washington, and um, you know, it, it uh, people say it failed. It, it it didn't fail. I mean, it's it didn't make the ballot, but but it did succeed because the whole point is to empower the people to make a change. And what what I sixteen hundred did for us is it took what Bernie had done and take took this concept of universal health care, a single payer health care. And made it mainstream effectively. I sixteen hundred took that to the next level. I mean, you know, we had hundreds of volunteers all across the country, or all across the state, working on this. And you just had a consciousness around this is a reality. And the question is when we're going to get it by. And of course, the idea was to get it by this year. But you know, we don't, even even though it's not going to make the the ballot, you know, look at just the the just uh, just the basics. Pramila, our you know our one of our most progressive uh, Congress human. Uh, just introduced a bill at the federal level to make it possible for states to write their own statewide universal health care bill at the legislative at the legislative level um, within the state legislature, which is incredible. And it's a, basically a direct offshoot of I-1600 was the fact that she, you know, that was so alive in her community and in her constituency that she that she was compelled to create a bill that would allow any state to do this. That's, I mean, that, that to me is what happened to I-1600 is it became a federal, a federal, um, uh, house resolution that's going to allow any, any state, including Pennsylvania to do that. Now we need to get me and a bunch of other progressives elected for her bill to go through. It's not going to go anywhere right now, but Hey, there you go. Power is still in the hands of the people and we can still do that state by state as a direct result of the work that was done in I-1600. So I'm calling it a victory, and um, and it is a victory. I mean, it's a, it's a victory in consciousness, and that's what this is all about. You know, we know we're shifting, and the only you know the question is how soon, and uh, you know, it, will we do it before it's too late? Is really you know the question in my mind. Yeah, Laura just uh, stated a hundred and two thousand signatures by right. volunteers. All volunteer. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the way it goes, you know, money is the word and, and, and these other, you know, we had, we had a Paul Allen back to um, gun control initiative where they were paying $7 a signature. People were literally flying from the East coast to come and cash in on that. This was an all volunteer, hundred percent volunteer uh, where, where you had, I mean, I don't even, I would love to know how many, we, we'll never know how many volunteers are on the campaign that were just hitting the streets day after day, doing it, doing it, doing it, bring them in. And, and yeah, I mean, when did they register? It must have been sometime in April or May. So, you know, in a matter of less than six months, 100,000 signatures is, is incredible. I mean, you know, we're talking about a, a, a viable percentage of the state, which it just shows you not only how much juice there is from, you know, from a people willing to support it at the most basic level of a signature, but at the level of really dedicating all of their spare time to it. Yeah, that's amazing. So, and, and you're totally right, because now people, there's pretty much no one in the United States who doesn't know what Medicare for all or universal health care, like they know these terms now. Right. They know that. Mainstream. Totally mainstream. It's, and with, and as a result, it is coming. You know, with the no, no thing so powerful as an idea whose time has come. I mean, it's time. We know that. The data is in, we, and there are other countries doing this effectively, and there's just no question about it. The only thing stopping it is the fact that our, um, 
elected officials are owned by the people who don't want that to happen. So still no. So how is it as far as in, in your state, um, as far as um, your representatives taking corporate money, are there a fair amount in your state who don't? No. I can't, I mean, uh, Pramila might not, I don't know. I mean, she, I, I haven't actually followed up a hundred percent. She's, you know, she's kind of touted as the progressive. She was endorsed by Bernie and, um, you know, all of them, everyone I've checked out and, uh, you know, the data for me is fairly old. I, I checked them all out, uh, when I first organized the Bernie Kratz because I saw all these people were elected super delegates who were going to rig the, the 2016 primary. And I wanted to know more about them. And, and I saw, you know, basically what everybody's saying that they are beholden to the big donors. I mean, I, I recently saw my opponents, he had just visited a detention center, a child detention center. And then, and then I asked one of my volunteers, Hey, can you check this out? I'm curious about this because I, you know, I, this guy gets a bunch of money from these guys. You know, I'm in the most militarized district in the entire country. We have more new, we have, we have over twice as many nuclear weapons as the rest of the, of the rest of the country combined here in CD six. And so my opponent is, is very popular with the military and gets a lot of money from him. anyway. So it didn't take long for somebody to shoot me back the data that, that, that the detention center that he was visiting for PR was run by a company that's on his donor list. Like, and, and my head just about exploded. And of course I'm not supposed to say that, right. Cause I'm a candidate. I'm not supposed to talk shit about my opponent, but you know, I mean, not talking shit if it's back. Well, I, exactly right, and and you know is a fact, and I, and I and of course I'm not going to take the time to go and vet it, even though I've asked a couple of people to vet it, and I would like to know. The truth is that they they are, you know, even if he's a good guy, and I think he is a good guy, he is beholden to these big corporations and 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 to the military industrial complex, and that's what we're dealing with here. Is that the, our our country is run by people who are beholden to those things, and that's kind of to be expected by a capitalist society. What we need is to figure out where we are on the spectrum between capitalism and socialism. And it's, you know, we're not one or the other. You can't be one or the other. They're not, they're not, they're mutually inclusive, not mutually exclusive. And we're, you know, kind of right here, but we need to get to the point where we're just, you know, making sure that people's basic needs are covered so that the, you know, the, so that our, our, our society, let alone our economy can thrive on, you know, this big old lie about trickle down economics it should be more like, uh, I don't know, evaporate up economics or, Trickle up economics. I guess that makes sense. Trickle up economics. That's what we're going for here. Yeah, no doubt. Right on. Um, you you talked about um, your district being heavily influenced by the military industrial complex. What about private prisons? Are those very prevalent? No, I mean, I like, like I said, I saw those guys on his donor list, but I don't. Uh, I can't even think of a private prison on the Olympic Peninsula right off hand. I mean, I there's there's the you know there's the ice ice facility where they think there are people being held, but I can't think of a private prison out here. It's not the right spot for it. Um, you know, we're we're pretty unique place in the world. You know, we're all wilderness. It's the Olympic the Olympic National Park, which is this you know it's its own mountain range and there's a giant national park. Is most is the district. It's like this giant lung of trees. It's incredible. It's a gem. Um, but yeah, we're not, we're, uh, I mean, I, yeah, I, I, I would want to, I would want to do more research before I, before I commented with any confidence. I, I don't know of any. Um. Okay, cool. Well, that's good. Cause hopefully that means there aren't any. <laughs> um, yeah, may or may I'm not. Just... I mean, it, it's one of many things that, that, well, that I and we should be as educated as possible about it and yeah. I'll put that on my list and hopefully get to that piece of my list. You know, and, and I digress back to what you were saying about taking corporate money and my, my viewers know I bring this up all the time, but we have to be diligent with searching who takes money and where it comes from, because I cannot tell you how many times people get hype and post all over Facebook. Oh my God, we have a victory because so-and-so won their primary. Um, you need to research where they got their money because they're not progressive. Yeah. So we have to be diligent and look at those things um, yeah. because anyone can say the word progressive, anyone. It, it's, yeah. it's, and it's lost so much of its meaning. Um, 
but yeah, I know you're, you're definitely all, uh, organic, which is awesome. Um, do you, um, what is your minimum wage there in your County? I know Seattle is different. Is that correct? Uh, minimum wage here. I thought it was 10. Hold on. It's posted on my wall. <clears throat> Are you serious, Jeffrey Denton? That's bananas. The Navy base owns the peninsula. That's incredible. Jeffrey's got a point. Um, yeah, the Navy base is incredibly powerful. That's where all the nuclear warheads and the subs are. And um, yeah, I mean, we're standing against Goliath with that particular conversation it's it's pretty crazy you know we have we in the in a cd6 we have uh from jeffrey from jeffrey's uh district we have uh growlers these uh i think they're f-18 growlers that are doing training runs over our heads and just got increased by some number of thousands of passes we get to hear them all the time we just have war jets flying over our heads and not to mention you know the subs passing by outside and when i check out the view from uh this beautiful town i live in you know, it's, um, it's many sailboats and sunlight and, and, uh, and pristine everything. And then there's, uh, the Navy magazine, bam, with a giant, you know, refueling ship. And, and I'm, you know, I'm not anti-military. I'm, I'm definitely a pro-peace candidate. And I, and I believe in, um, what I call responsible use of military force. We, you know, there's still time there. It is still a, an age in which we need to have a military. I object to the vast overuse of it, the misuse of it, the way we're, you know, basically protecting wealthy people's interests, especially at the cost of lives. And we have no business, uh, you know, like, I mean, Derek just signed the $717 billion expansion, including expand the nuclear arsenal. What the hell do we need more nuclear weapons for? Especially when we can't, you know, you, you won't even sign on to HR six, seven, you know, to the Medicare for all bill, you know, just taking care of the people, you know, when it, you know, 5% of that 717 billion could, could just wipe out homelessness and, 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 and hunger in one fell swoop. It's crazy. We're the most powerful and wealthiest nation the world has ever known. What are we doing with hungry and cold people on the streets while we put more money into guns and bombs? You know who else well, signed that bill? Cory Booker, Kamala Harris, and Elizabeth um, Warren. Yeah, I, I mean, it's mind, it's mind bending, like incredible. And I mean, what are we gonna do? I mean, we, we have no choice. We have to run at all levels and we have to reinsert the people in, in the government. I mean, the, there is a disconnect, a disconnect between what's going on uh, at, at the top and what's going on on the ground. The people, it's clear what the people want. People want sanity. <laughs> People want their basic needs met and everybody's basic needs met. Absolutely. Um, do you support a federal job guarantee? Yeah. Oh, I, I mean, I don't, yeah, exactly. I mean, there's, there's every reason why we could do that. It, it, it's, I mean, the, many of these conversations in my book boil down to use of energy, available energy. You know, we have vast resources. We have the, I mean, there, it would take with, let's say the, the progressive movement um, rose so swiftly and so effectively that we had a majority in the House of Reps and the Senate. And um, and let's say we got a president that wasn't going to veto everything we, you know, we put through. It would take, in my estimation, it would take less than one, one congressional cycle, two years. We could, we could easily set up the country where everybody who was able and willing to work and wanted a decent job in just green infrastructure could do so. I, I think it would take very little. You take industrial hemp plus solar plus wind. I mean, you wouldn't need much more than that, but you could you get, get a little creative and, and add something a little, you know, uh, add geothermal or, or, um, uh, you know, mushrooms, you know, mushroom cultivation and, and the incredible vast potential of all of these things and dump 10% of that 717 billion into it. Yes, you can absolutely guarantee everybody a job uh, in this country. That is not that tall of an order. 
Yeah, absolutely. Do you, I know a lot of people say fight for 15 in Pennsylvania, our minimum wage is 725 or 750, which is yeah. abhorrent. Um, do you stand with the people on fight for 15 or do you think that is even too low itself? Well, it's definitely too low. I mean, it's, I, it's, it's like a lot of things in life and politics. I think it's a step in the right direction. Is it far off? I don't know. I mean, I don't, I, um, I support it because I support the people who are fighting that fight. And I, and I think that it's better than what we've got, but I mean, it costs, you know, if you do the math, it costs 25 bucks an hour to survive where I live and anywhere, anywhere urban in this state. So 15 bucks is, you know, you're below the po poverty line. You're still, um, you know, you're still food bank and food stamps and not, not that there's any problem with that in, in my estimation. Uh, I've certainly been there and support others in being there, but it shouldn't be that way, especially with the stigma attached to it. That's crazy. Um, I think that the, the the minimum wage really needs to be associated with the cost of living, and it needs to be higher than 15 in the vast majority of places. I think that 15 as a minimum minimum wage, maybe, so that you can't have a minimum wage lower than 15, and then and then you adjust for the cost of living in the place you're at, maybe. Um, so it's complicated. Yes, I stand with those people, and and it's definitely not it's not the, that's not the end of the game. Just like RCV is not the end of, of, of where we need to get to with voting. And the, you know, the ACA was a very small step in the right direction with healthcare. Uh, we, we have to, we have to work with what we've got. And we also have to shoot for I found something a whole about new level. In the right direction with healthcare. Check it Excuse out. me while I talk to Sue. <laughs> <laughs> she wants to tell us about healthcare. Sweet. Uh, apparently, what did she say about healthcare? Okay, I lost her. Anyway, yeah. Does that answer your question? I mean, I yeah. But. Yeah, totally. That's awesome. Um, so your primary is actually coming up in less than a month, um, August seventh. Um, less than and, a week, actually. <laughs> well, yeah, actually, right on. So. People in Washington, please pay attention to that. I have, um, I, I've personally endorsed um, Tambourine Borelli. Um, I'm looking at having her back on. I freaking love her to pieces. Um, I'm having awesome. Sarah Smith on on Friday, who is Beautiful. blowing up. Um, she's really making waves um, in the Bernie Kratz arena. Um, so there's a lot of great candidates where you are for sure. You have a lot of great comrades and allies. Um, what are some other things that you're looking at doing in your area? What else are you passionate about? Uh, well, right now it's all focused on that. Um, I mean, that's, I mean, it's all there's time for I mean, I, You know, I'm, I'm a father and I have a full-time job, so I have to marshal my resources. I don't, I don't have time to do much else. You know, the ballots drop in, 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 they mail out in seven days and we'll be on the ground in eight days. So the primary is live and, and the military and ex-military already have their ballots. There are already ballots on the ground. Um, so, you know, most of my energy is focused on this. We have a big event uh, next Wednesday night about this time, I think, yeah, six to eight, right, right at this time next week, where we're going to do some creative uh, online um, uh, spamming. For lack of a better word, we're going to take, you know, the Bernie Kratz, the Washington Bernie Kratz have become a vetting, a vetting entity. And we vet for, year, you know, all year long, uh, we vet candidates and have a list of people who we've researched and interviewed and such as that. And so we'll go and post it, you know, on a page and then everybody will comment on it and boost on it and um, try and create a hubbub because, you know, Facebook is suppressing posts as, uh, as you are well aware. Um a lot of a lot of uh, real resistance is being placed in our way. So we, the workaround is to use comments and um, reactions and and kind of underground uh, methodology. So we'll, that'll be next Wednesday, and uh, trying to get as many people involved with that. And then we'll do the same thing with Twitter, and then we'll go to Minds and MeWe, and and basically hit all the platforms in that way. And um, you know that's that that's the big thing, you know, trying to get as much exposure as possible and, and not so much, you know, I'm a, I'm very much a not me us candidate. Like I've, I actually have a really hard time talking about myself, but I can talk about us when, when, you know, when you mentioned us being Sarah Smith, Tambourine Borelli, Dorothy Gasquet, like, I'm just like, 
oh yeah, I can, you know, I can, I can give my all when we're talking about us. And that's really what we're talking about here. And so the, the, the big push of, you know, the Bernie Kratz is, is to, is to get some hubbub going about us because we're, you know, we're like three degrees of separation from every voter in the state of Washington in this age. This is, this is the third millennium. Like, you know, the, the distance between here and everybody is nothing, absolutely nothing. And we have the power to do that. And the rules are changing as a direct result. So we'll see how it goes. Absolutely. Yeah. The, um, there's so much talk about 2020 and I, I think people need to be more cognizant of we're not going to have a progressive in 2020 unless we get people like you elected. Now we need to like put that shit off until November and let's worry about, cause we have a lot of badass candidates that are, yeah. you know, hitting me up saying, I can't get enough volunteers. I don't have enough donations. And it upsets me because I'm like, why? These people are good candidates. Why? It's one thing if people want to stay home and not vote. I vote every time regardless. But if you want to stay home and not vote, that's your choice. But if you have someone to vote for and you're sitting at home, fuck that. Like, People need to go out and support and vote for good progressive candidates. Um, yeah, so that's my my uh, soapbox that you guys, you know, just tell your friends and, and also just get more active. We still have primaries through, um, you know, part of September. Um, so yeah. we're not done yet. We still have some going on. I believe there's still 20. Um, yeah. So, yeah, the movement is sure. to follow the primaries. I mean, to the degree that we're able, I mean, everybody is going to be focused on their own area, but ideally, immediately afterwards, you would then focus on the next area that has a primary. And, and that's a tall order, especially if you're a candidate, but for everybody else, it's really doable. And, you know, like there's this group, the, the Sandernistas, um, do incredible work. And they, they literally just follow the primary. And, um, and most of them have rallied around Sarah Smith. And I love watching what's going on there because there's a lot of outer staters there who are making a huge impact in Washington. And that's going to result in us having some membership in Congress. And I, I think her, her chances are very good as a result of that and many other things. And it's really awesome. I mean, we live in that age. We live in the third millennium. This is the technology age. All the rules have changed. All those old rules that you used to play by that people still think are true, they're gone. They're gone. Yeah, right on. That's a really good point. If you should, well, when you get off to um, and you progress on to the next um, point, what are you going to focus on between now and November? What are What's going to be your main focus? Well, um, I mean, if I, if I survive the primary, which, you know, according to any logical political analyst of the old terms is, you know, is next, you know, my chances are next to nothing. Um, it would probably, it, no, it would have to look like full-time campaigning, like to the degree that I probably back off of my job um, a long ways. I mean, I, I can't actually do that. I have too many commitments, but my guess is, my guess is it would look like this giant circle that is the, you know, the Olympic Peninsula is a, is a circle and, and the, in the middle is this incredible national park, Basically, I would be somehow keeping up my full-time job and just circling around it and making point-to-point -point stops over and over and over again until November. That that would be that would be what would I would be required to do, um, because that would be the right thing to do. There, there's no question about it. Um, now, if I don't survive the primary, it's really simple. I just pick whoever uh, did survive the primary and I put all my weight behind them, and that'll be fun. It's easier easier for me to support other people than it is to campaign myself. But, you know, I'm, I'm, I've been getting over it and willing to get over it. And, um, and we'll see, like I said, the rules have all changed, you know, and it's not a matter of, it's not a question of if, but when it shifts, you know, it's not a question of if Kilmer will fall to some progressive, it's when, is it this, is it this cycle? And it could be the cycle. There's no, you know, there's nothing stopping it other than the old mindset. The paradigm is shifting and if it shifts fast enough, then I'm going to beat him. And if it doesn't shift fast enough, I'm, you know, it's going to be some other year, either me or somebody else. And uh, I don't, I'm not attached so much to when it happens. I'm just going to keep on, you know, um, steadily putting pressure in, you know, uh, indefinitely until until my kids have a, a secure and bright future. 
Awesome. So because you are so, so introspective and, and you're, I definitely um, sense some philosophical thoughts within you as well. What, what do you suggest as far as our movement, how divided it is um, as far as, you know, uh, you know, burners and greens and Dementor and Demexit. And it, it seems like there's just so much hate online um, yeah. What do you think we can do to bridge all of that ugliness? That's a great question. And, I, and in my estimation, it's the question of the ages. The, the real question is that, you know, we have all these kind of more superficial questions of end of the duopoly, get money out of politics, you know, fix the election system, all this stuff. But all of those things are contingent upon the people, and especially the left, but the people really, the 99% getting along and to be effective. And uh, so the question you ask, the, the, the answer is, is just doing the stuff that we all know is the right thing, a little bit of humility and uh, uh, being willing to be wrong, being willing to apologize. Uh, it's like, you know, being in a marriage where you're five years in and, and sometimes you really, really get to that point where and then you're going to be like at the end of the day, okay, let's make it work anyway. Even, you know, and even if, you know, even if it's a marriage that's going to separate or, or whatever, you still, you still take the extra time to make it work, which is hard work. You know, you gotta, you gotta own up to, you know, when you make a mistake, you gotta be willing to own up to it. You know, I, I, uh, I, this happened a couple of times in the movement in Washington where I've, where I've had some sort of um, really challenging exchange with a person who's a, a, a good, a, a powerful ally. Sarah Smith is one example where I had a big reaction to something she did completely innocent, but brought up my shit, so to speak. And I, I you know, I just took the time to, to take a breath and kind of get over it and feel what I was feeling and figure out what that was, what, what, what that was really all about. And then set, you know, and, and making an apology about that was a really big deal. And, um, I, you know, I could rattle off a, a half a dozen examples of how that has, um, happened in my own personal world. And I also could rattle off a half a dozen examples where, uh, one degree of separation away that didn't happen and the rift still exists. And, to the detriment of both sides and the movement. And so we have to do the work and it's, and that part of the work is really spiritual work. It's inner work. It's, it's private work that, that we have to do ourselves and then we have to take it to the people around us. But it's, um, there's nothing easy about it. In fact, it's harder than all of this stuff. It's harder than running for Congress. It's harder to admit you're wrong than it is to run for Congress. Definitely. But it's what's required is what we're going to have to do. And uh, it's what, you know, like this, the Vermont Progressive Party is ready to unite the, the bring back the Progressive Party of, of, of the early 1900s, finally. And yes. we're going to have to get over that, that stuff. You know, those bridges that we burned in 2016 will need to be rebuilt or, uh, or we need to invent uh, small choppers or, I don't know, flyover engines or something. Yeah, for sure. Um, what um, if you want to leave our viewers with something, with one thing to take away, so that they vote for you or recommend you to other people in Washington State, or you know, send you a few dollar donation, anything like that? What do you want to leave them with? Well, not me, us. Um, I would rather the energy go into us and um, the way us has expressed in my world is the Washington Bernie Kratz coalition. We've vetted a lot of candidates and we have a list that includes the incredible tambourine Borelli, Sarah Smith, Gigi, you know, uh, the senatorial candidate, Gigi Ferguson and Dorothy Gasquet, you know, these incredible people and many, you know, and in, in the state level races. And, you know, we have an event next Wednesday where we're going to really push uh, us not me. I don't, you know, I don't, I, please don't give me your money. It's not, it's, it's, it's it, the time for that is long past. It's, it's not time for that. The energy needs to go into the movement and that, that is a, a great place to, to, to do that. So, uh, you know, you can find me, um, if you go to tylervega.com, it's my name.com, tylervega.com, uh, will, you can easily get to my Facebook page and add me on messenger. Uh, the friends list is full. full. And I'll, you know, I, what I would like more than anything is to have people show up on Wednesday night, the night that ballots mail out, even if you're from out of state, especially for, if you're out of state, you know, because you can, you, you know, you in Pennsylvania sending me to Congress or me and Sarah and Dorothy and Gigi and, uh, and Sarah, I miss anybody. 
is is equally as powerful as you send in somebody from your own state because it's gonna give us the, eventually the majority we need. So um, check out the Washington Bernie Kratz Coalition would be my request, and uh, you can find your way there by contacting me through my website, or just Google that, and you'll find them, uh, them us, and let's do this. Awesome. Um, Crystal Folk, um, a viewer, is, wants more info on the event. Um, the is would it be if um, if she goes to the Washington Bernie Kratz Facebook page? Is it on that? Yeah, the Facebook page is called Washington Bernie Kratz Coalition, and it should be okay. the pin post in there. I would think, and if it's not, I'll pin it right now, uh, or somebody will pin it right now. I might, um, maybe, or we can put it in. Hey, Franklin, can you stick that in the? Can you put that in the chat? Is that easy thing for you to do? The uh, you enjoy the the all hands on deck events. Should be in the uh, Washington Bernie Kratz admin channel. Anyway, we'll, we'll we'll get it posted. We'll get it put in this comments in these comments. Okay. And, uh, yeah, the, um, the somebody event. posted the web your website as well. So thank you, Lance. Appreciate that. Um, cool. Yeah, I mean, I, the one to one contact is where it's at. Just send me a you know go to my Facebook page and click on message and add me on Messenger and send me a message. And you know, I'm all about just having the conversation and networking around that. You know, that event is where all the energy is going right now. Awesome. I adore you, Tyler. You're freaking amazing. I wish I could you vote too. for you myself. Um, you are voting for me. This You are effectively voting for me. This is the Aww. most powerful thing that can be done. You know, I, I love what I do. I'm fortunate. I get to meet beautiful people from all over who inspire. Um, thank you guys so much for joining us, especially after the issues I had electronically earlier. Um, so thank you guys. Friday night, we have another um, Washington um, Bernie Kratt, Sarah Smith. Um, Monday, <laughs> Monday, I'm doing something bananas. I am actually going to be having some uh, Bernie delegates um, to my house. We're going to have a basement dweller episode. Um, and we're going to talk, <laughs> no lie, we will be in my finished basement. Um, <laughs> and we're going to be talking about um, what our lives are like two years after being at that convention. Um, wow. So it's going to be an intense, uh, intense show with, with four of us on Monday. Uh, but yeah, before that, we have Sarah Smith on Friday. So again, thank you guys so much for watching. Please share and promote Tyler, um, or um, if you're in Washington, Sarah, Tam, Dorothy, any of those people in your district, um, they all would be great to vote for. Um, so once again, thank you so much, Tyler. Best of luck with everything. Thank you, really appreciate your work. Absolutely. Thanks guys.